I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards all men. I shall die innocent, and it shall yet be said of me, he was murdered in cold blood. The prophet Joseph Smith uttered these foretelling words three days before he was assassinated and died as a martyr for his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and the restoration of the fullness of his gospel to the earth. On the afternoon of Thursday, June 27, 1844, about five o'clock, the prophet Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram sealed their testimonies of the restoration of the gospel with their blood. When a mob of approximately 150 to 200 men stormed the Carthage jail and took their lives. Carthage jail is hallowed ground and dedicated as a memorial in remembrance of the two martyrs. Joseph and Hiram were ordered to report to Carthage, Illinois to answer to charges from apostates and enemies of the church that as Nauvoo mayor and city councilman, they had illegally directed the destruction of a newspaper press, the Nauvoo Expositor. Accompanied by 17 friends, they traveled a half day on horseback from Nauvoo to Carthage on Monday, June 24th, and spent the night at the Hamilton Hotel. The next day, they surrendered themselves to Constable David Bettesworth and submitted themselves for trial. Enemies of the saints from surrounding areas also were in Carthage with ill intent, where a lynch mob could mete out popular justice. The next day, before Joseph and other Nauvoo City officials presented themselves for the hearing, about eight in the morning, Constable Bettesworth served warrants against Joseph and Hiram for treason. Bail was posted on the original charges uh, for the other city councilmen, and most of them returned to Nauvoo. Later in the early evening, Joseph and Hiram were served an arrest warrant on the charge of treason. Subsequently, rather than spend a second night at the hotel, they were moved here to the jail at Carthage for their safety against the rabble that was gathered in the streets and around the door. They were placed in Carthage jail under the promise of protection from Thomas Ford, governor of Illinois. However, Governor Ford later left for Nauvoo and unexplainably charged their enemies, the Carthage Greys, to guard them. Carthage Jail is a stone house 34 by 28 feet and three stories high with walls two and a half feet thick. Carthage Jail was also the home of the jailer, George W. Stigel, his wife and seven children. The jailer and his family lived in two of the main floor rooms, the dining area and this spacious parlor, as well as in the bedroom, which is on the second floor immediately above this parlor and a third floor loft area for the children. They housed prisoners that were awaiting trial and prepared meals for them, for which they charged a fee. When Stigel received his charges on the evening of Tuesday, June 25th, he first took them upstairs to the iron-barred darkened dungeon room, usually reserved for criminals. Later, he moved Joseph, Hiram, and eight men that accompanied them downstairs to this debtor's cell, commonly used to house those awaiting a trial where the group of 10 men slept on the floor or benches, possibly with some blankets. Jailer Stigel took breakfast with the brethren the next morning in this dining area. After breakfast, he offered his own upstairs bedroom for their comfort. In this room, the group of brethren discussed the upcoming court case, after which several left to confer with legal counsel to request a change of venue to Quincy, and others to request Governor Ford to come to the jail to meet with them, which he did about 9.30 that morning. They discussed the particulars of the difficulties, and the Prophet Joseph Smith related events that led to the destruction of the press in Nauvoo. Forty-five minutes later, Governor Ford left, pledging to protect them from violence. He told them that if the troops marched the next morning to Nauvoo, as he then expected, they should probably be taken along in order to ensure their personal safety. 
The remainder of the day was spent writing letters and discussing possible divine deliverance from their difficult circumstances, as well as avenues of legal defense. They were taken from the jail by Constable Bettesworth to the courtroom and then returned. They learned that the trial would be deferred until Saturday, June 29th. Wednesday, June 26th, and much of the day of the fateful Thursday, June 27th, saw the brethren giving attention to such tasks as that of Dan Jones and Stephen Markham, who used a penknife to whittle a warped door to get it to latch shut. The prophet, patriarch, uh, took their turns preaching to the guards, several of whom were relieved before their time was out because they admitted they were convinced of the innocence of the prisoners. They frequently admitted that they'd been imposed upon and more than once it was heard, let us go home boys for I'll not fight any longer against these men. The afternoon previous to the martyrdom, Constable Bettysworth and the enemies of the prophet were able to take him from the custody of the jailer under the pretext of Joseph needing again to appear in court. Apparently, Joseph felt that it was all a ruse to get him out of the protection of the jail building where he could be killed by one of the mob uh, without detection of who was responsible. Those with him reported that upon seeing the mob gathering and assuming a threatening aspect, Joseph concluded it best to go with them then, and putting on his hat, walked boldly into the midst of a hollow square of the Carthage Grays evidently expecting to be massacred in the streets before arriving at the courthouse. He politely locked arms with the worst mobocrat he could see, and Hiram locked arms with Joseph, followed by Dr. Richards and escorted by a guard to the courtroom. Now, after appearing in court, Joseph and the other brethren were returned to the jail where Joseph and Hiram spent the last night of their mortal lives. During the evening, Hiram read and commented on passages from the Book of Mormon that referred to occasions when God delivered his saints from imprisonments among their enemies. That evening, they retired late. Joseph and Hiram rested on the bed, and their friends lay on mattresses on the floor. After hearing a gunfire, Joseph laid on the floor with Dan Jones on his left and John S. Fulmer on his right. Joseph laid out his right arm and said to John Fulmer, Lay your head on my arm for a pillow, Brother John. Those in the room recalled that Joseph made comments such as, I would like to see my family again, and I would to God that I could preach to the saints in Nauvoo once more. As Joseph lay on the floor next to Dan Jones, he whispered to him, Are you afraid to die? And Dan said, has that time come, think ye? Engaged in such a cause, I do not think that death would have many terrors. And Joseph replied, you'll yet see wells and fulfill the appointed mission before you die, as Dan Jones already had a mission call. In the morning, Dan Jones inquired of the guard the cause of the disturbance in the night. Frank Worrell, the officer, uh, of the guard, who is one of the Carthage Greys, in a very bitter spirit said, we've had too much trouble to bring old Joe Smith here to ever let him escape alive. And unless you want to die with him, you'd better leave before sundown. For neither he nor his brother nor anyone who will remain with them will see the sun set today. Well, Governor Ford was uh, told of this and other threats to murder Joseph Smith, but he would not give any real credence to them and later left Carthage to go to Nauvoo with his troops. By afternoon, uh, John S. Fulmer, Stephen Markham, and Dan Jones had been sent on errands outside the jail, reducing the group of men that were left in the jail to four, Willard Richards, John Taylor, Joseph Smith, and Hiram, of course. The afternoon was sultry as Joseph, Hiram, and their companions, John Taylor and Willard Richards, stayed in the jailer's personal upstairs bedroom for their comfort. Joseph requested John Taylor to sing one of the prophet's favorite songs, A Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief. Given the circumstances of the moment, the song is aptly and poignantly meaningful. The song relates the attempts of an individual to help a suffering stranger who, after asking for the ultimate sacrifice, that being if the provider would die in the unjustly condemned stranger's place, 
he revealed himself as the Savior. About 5.20 p.m. Thursday, June 27th, an armed mob of men with blackened faces surrounded the jail, a few rushing inside and up the stairs. The brethren had opened windows and the door to the bedroom for ventilation. They closed the door, pressed against it to keep it closed to the mob. In a matter of moments, those that had rushed up the stairs of the jail forced open the door to the bedroom. As Hiram retreated from the door, he snapped his pistol when a ball struck him in the left side of his nose. He fell on his back on the floor, saying, I am a dead man. He was shot again several times as he lay on the floor. Joseph fell to his side, exclaiming, Oh, my poor dear brother Hiram. About that time, uh, John Taylor, who had been holding the door closed and parrying some of the muskets as they came through, looked toward the window and tried to make an escape out the window when he was hit both with balls from inside, possibly others coming through the window that was open. I think they surmised to begin with because his watch had uh, stopped at the exact time that a bullet maybe had hit the watch. Others had suggested it might have come as he fell on the windowsill. <laughs> uh, he then fell back into the room and he found some way to roll or to move underneath the bed uh, in the jailer's bedroom. Joseph Smith went to the window and may have been shot both from the outside and from the inside. Joseph falls literally through the window exclaiming, Oh Lord my God. From here you can clearly see the second story window Joseph fell from after he was shot in the jailer's bedroom. Some reports indicate that they took Joseph's body, actually set it up against this well, and shot him again. Willard Richards had been looking down uh, through the windows, saw the body, saw the men gathering around, even heard and saw the call that the Mormons were coming. And as he was leaving the room, mm. maybe expecting them to come to kill him still, he heard the voice of John Taylor from under the bed asking him or crying out to him, take me with you. Leaving for us then two witnesses who seal their testimony with their blood with the prophet Joseph and the patriarch Hiram and two witnesses who live to tell the world what happened here in truth. The life of one of the greatest of all prophets had come to an end. He lived faithfully to the finish of his mission. The Lord revealed, Many have marveled because of his death, but it was needful that he should seal his testimony with his blood, that he might be honored and the wicked might be condemned. Wilford Woodruff reflected, I used to have peculiar feelings about his death and the way in which his life was taken. I felt that if, with the consent and good feelings of the brethren that waited on him after he crossed the river to leave Nauvoo, Joseph could have had his desire. He would have pioneered the way to the Rocky Mountains. But since then, I have been fully reconciled to the fact that it was according to the program, that it was required of him as the head of this dispensation, that he should seal his testimony with his blood and go hence to the spirit world, holding the keys of this dispensation to open up the mission that is now being performed by way of preaching the gospel to the spirits in prison. <laughs>